Our seminar today is on mesh testing, on test methods for mesh. And uh, it is hell. If you're going through hell, keep going. It's not simple. And so we're going to explore all the complexity of mesh, but it is exponentially complex. Our agenda today, uh, we're going to start with uh, just a little bit of history of how mesh came about. And then we're going to move into some practical considerations. When you're setting up a mesh test bed, you know, what are some of the things to watch out for? Uh, then we're going to move into a demo. So she's going to do a four node mesh demo. That system is actually in the office that's facing the windows. And feel free to uh, go there during the break and take a look at it. Uh, and then we're gonna, and then Nandini, who is not on our speaker list, but we co-opted her at the last minute, uh, Nandini Venkatraman, from our Boston area office, um, we got her to um, help with this four-node mesh demo a little bit. So it's gonna be Sushi and Nandini. You guys, raise your hands. There you go. Uh, and then uh, we're gonna talk about roaming and bend steering and why that's important in a mesh. And uh, then we're going to talk about test methods. What are the accepted test methods in the industry for mesh? And uh, Tuan is going to give us uh, a demo of this complex system here, Stack Small Net Builder. Then we're going to leave it running because that system is it's all automated. There is a Python script that runs for a long time. So Tuan doesn't have to click any buttons except start it. And we're going to go eat lunch and while it's running. And then after lunch, we'll have some results that are going to be in our database graphical, which will be really cool. We're going to look at those. And then um, at the end, we're going to talk about some of the IoT meshes. Now, our material is mostly Wi-Fi. However, all the mesh topologies, mesh test beds, all those principles apply. They are independent of technology. Uh, they apply to Bluetooth, Zigbee, uh, which is Thread today, Wison, and any other meshes. Uh, but we, you know, we're going to spend most of the time on Wi-Fi. But of course, um, we can discuss the other technologies. Uh, we welcome your input as to how you'd like us to address testing of those. Um, and uh, we can chat at break or at lunchtime. Uh, a, a short history. So you guys see these data rates here. This is a very old slide. It comes, I don't know, probably 10 years ago I made presentations. And that those data rates, 18 megabits per second and 36 megabits per second, they were fast at the time I made that slide. We did not have MIMO, these are old times. Time flew by very fast. But the way that Mesh was born, it was a repeater. And um, the problem that uh, the industry was solving with this repeater is if you have a de devices that are two or three rooms apart, they tend, as you all know, tend to drop to low data rates. And then they take a long time to get on and off the air to transmit some amount of information. So we want to speed them up. And so the repeater was born. And the repeater would shorten the links. It breaks the long link into two shorter links. And then we get uh, faster rates. And then it's better than not having it, because we get on and off the air fast. And from this repeater, this, is how, this was the first primitive mesh. And uh, the way the meshes evolved, and the meshes took quite a long time to really get out in the market. Uh, we'll talk about uh, 11S. 11S was defined um, over 10 years ago. And there were cities, there was, there were, um, cities were trying to deploy uh, wireless meshes for connectivity. And that never took off. There were some, some issues with range. There were just technical issues uh, with, with those meshes. Uh, and so now they're making a comeback. But the basic idea was um, we used to have all the access points. Each one of them had an Ethernet line. It was connected to Ethernet and could get out on the Internet. And the clients would associate with each IP. Uh, in the new architecture with mesh, the back hole is no longer Ethernet. It's now wireless. And so we're going to focus on this architecture. And so sometimes we have different bands for the back hole. Could be a back hole is 5 gigahertz, and your, your station um, channels are in the 2.4. 
sometimes we have a back hole and high 5 gigahertz or low 5 gigahertz band and then the clients get both 5 and 2.4 channels. But it varies from vendor to vendor. So uh, 11S is the formal IEEE standard for meshing. And uh, not uh, all the products today follow it. Some do, some don't. Some of the meshes today are proprietary. But uh, essentially, the challenges with defining mesh, uh, first of all, it's a wireless distribution system. You no longer have this AP client. It's not a simple relationship. For example, for authentication and security and quality of service, negotiation used to be between client and AP. And now these mesh nodes, they have to auto-negotiate with one another because they have to see and, and communicate with their peers, with their neighbors in the mesh. And there's a protocol for discovering your neighbors, uh, associating, authenticating, negotiating with them, how you communicate with them on the back hole. Uh, there is a protocol for self-forming and self-healing. So part of this neighbor discovery is self-forming. If one of the links breaks, we have to reroute all the connections. So routing among these mesh nodes, if there are a lot of them, uh, is exponentially complex. Just if any of you know what the traveling salesman problem is, is pretty much the same as routing on the internet. You have a lot of routers, and when you do a trace route, you hop around. Sometimes you have 10 uh, hops, sometimes you have eight. It varies, it's dynamic. And so basically the same kind of routing algorithms were being adopted by these 11S uh, meshes. And um, the industry, basically the recommendation is don't go over 32 nodes in a mesh, keep this routing simple. Uh, but of course, 32 is way more than anybody is deploying today. Today, most of our products are three, three nodes. They come out of the box as three. We've seen some that can extend to four or more nodes. And essentially, the goal is to get coverage. So let's say we're in a house. Uh, we want to drop one node into each room. We have coverage. And we don't need to run an Ethernet line into each room to connect these APs. But what we're going to discuss today, that coverage is easy. Load sharing is hard. So uh, load balancing, which is uh, band steering. So you have devices, and, and devices are like stubborn children, right? Most of them uh, were made in Taiwan. No, no offense intended, guys. Um, and uh, with some guy who wrote the driver, and uh, it doesn't, they don't always go to the best AP. Some of them are sticky. A lot of the clients are still sticky. I think the industry is trying to manage them. We're going to talk about 11V, a way to tell them, you shall go to that AP, or you shall go to the one right next to you, not stick to the one two rooms away from you, and, and hog the air link with six megabits per second. We don't want to do that. But that's really the challenge. The challenge is not coverage. The challenge is to make sure that clients go to the AP that's right next to them and be able to get on and off the air fast because now they communicate at a fastest possible rate. Okay, so that's the complex part. We're gonna talk about that a lot. All right, so before we dive into all that detail, let's talk about meshes. Uh, meshes come in different topologies. They can be linear, which we, let's say in a train station, we put AP, 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 and they mesh to one another. Uh, they can be star topology. Most cellular networks are star topology, where you have one central node and nodes around them. And they can be full meshes. A full mesh means every node sees every other node in the mesh. Okay, so we'll talk about, we'll focus mostly on this because this is a superset of everything else. So how do we connect them up in our test beds? So there are two basic ways to do it, either conduct it, with the conventional splitters, combiners. Some people call them splitters. Some people call them combiners. I can say either splitters is a shorter word, so we tend to use that on our labels, so splitters. Um, and uh, we, have, uh, we use MIMO splitters, uh, which are 4 by 4 So these four terminals uh, are common terminal. 
And in our diagrams, we use symbols. This little square, that means four connectors. So this little square corresponds to four connectors on a combiner or on the octabox enclosure or anywhere else. So these are the one to four and one to two splitters here. And, but of course, we can also make splitters, combiners, over the air. Okay. So we use 4x4 four four antenna arrays. We have high gain antennas. We have uh, one here, uh, and, and you're welcome to play with it. They're really nice because we can actually, we have plastic hardware there on a bolt joint, so I can point it vertical, horizontal, any way I want. Tighten some of these screws. They're on their own little carts. I can reposition them, which you will find is important for a lot of this. MIMO, multi-user MIMO, it's very important to have good antenna. Antennas, are both high gain and also the ones that are easy to point and control diversity for MIMO. We'll get to that later. Nandini will show some demos of that. But, but really, this is a simple, this is one example arrangement where we have four, this is a link of four cables essentially coming in. And these four links, I'm, I'm showing them horizontal, they come from four different enclosures. And a lot of the way we cable up our meshes is we go from high gain antenna through what we call a quad antenna. We've got them here, um, and then to another high gain antenna. And so that's the simplest way to configure. And it turns out we, can, uh, we have about 20 dB of loss from one mesh enclosure to another that way. And these attenuators are 90 dB of range. They're controllable in half dB steps. So what we'll show is how we can move these nodes, either position them <coughs> abruptly or move them with some velocity. Uh, and the controlled velocity, we can move all the mesh nodes close together within 20 dB of one another, which means in the same room. And then we can move them apart so they don't see one another at all and don't see anything else. So we can isolate. This way we can test mesh forming, self-healing, you know, what's going on. So we'll show you all that. But there is something to be aware of in the mesh, uh, which we come across all the time. In the splitter, when we use a splitter, whether it's over the air or conducted, we have a, what we call insertion loss. We have one common terminal. In, even in the 4x4 four four splitter, the set of four connectors we'll call one terminal, right? It's a common port on the splitter, even though it's 4x4. Four four. And then we have non-common ports. They're not inputs. They're, they're not outputs. They're bidirectional, of course. They're just non-common ports. And so there's insertion loss from any non-common port to the common port. And then there is what we call splitter isolation. And these are uh, between any pair of non-common modes, nodes into the splitter, OK? So this quad splitter, basically, this is four splitters here. There's four to one. And that's how we uh, get MIMO links. So um, <coughs> the more, these are basically standard magnetic splitters. It's a textbook design. What we do differently is we make sure they're completely isolated. Even if you point a directional antenna at one of our splitters, right? on it, there will be no leakage into the test bed. If you get off-the-shelf splitters, we often do see them pick up interference. Uh, the nodes, the Wi-Fi nodes, are extremely sensitive. Uh, they, they can detect a small fraction of a microvolt, so it doesn't take much. Even though it says hermetically sealed, it will couple interfere. So we made them completely uh, isolated. That's our innovation. But other than that, it's a textbook design. So all the splitters will have this coupling. It has to do with the magnetics inside the splitter and how it's designed to couple to the common terminal. They're typically 20 to 25 dB apart. It depends on the position of the port, physical position. You know, it varies. It's not that well controlled. Uh, and uh, so 20 to 25 dB, maybe, give or take, OK? Now, over the air, we can have a little more isolation, and it depends on where we hang the antennas. If we hang them far apart, we can get more isolation. Isolation is important. I'll tell you why in a couple of slides. 
So isolation, basically this is a, a diagram of a four node mesh. So every node is a circle in this diagram. The lines have four links. And this node is essentially probably a one to four splitter, this thing. And from any terminal to any terminal, we'll see that isolation, whatever it happens to be. And it will load down other paths in the mesh. They're not independent. So we can also make meshes which, with combined over the air combiners and, and conducted combiners. <coughs> so there's some flexibility. Sometimes uh, we have customers with older enclosures that have fewer ports and um, they don't have enough ports. So we put a combiner in and combine them. Sometimes we have enough ports, we can put, do pure over the air combining, which is simpler. Uh, and this is one example of a mesh we like. It's not a full mesh. You don't always need a full mesh. So here you have three lines coming into this node four. This is two combined and one over the air. That's what that is. We've got a PAL, which is an, a client feeding into node one. It's just a logical diagram. We, have, we can control the path losses so we can break these links. We can have routing. We have a console PC. We can run traffic through the mesh let's say to a PAL, or this could be a real station. And uh, we just run, let's say we've set up a path from one to four to three to two, and it found a good path, or from one to two is a shorter path between the PAL, and it likes that path, but then we go and whack this attenuator, take it out, all right, now it has to find another path, one to four to three to two, or one to four to two. So it has some choices to make, even though it's not a full mesh, uh, it, it does put your logic through its paces. So those of you who are testing your routing software, you can um, challenge your logic algorithms. Say uh, you give it the equivalent uh, you know, number of hops, but different conditions on the air link. And then you can make one path have very bad conditions, maybe interference or low signal or multipath. And then Dini will show us later all these impairments we can introduce. And the other path, same number of hops, but clean. You know, does your mesh logic know enough to select the right path? You know, so this is all, you have all these knobs in our platform to test that out. And this is mesh logic, these are the mesh nodes, how do they find the neighbors, whether they connect with the right neighbors and so forth. Then, you know, just some examples. We have recently for, uh, built um, some shelves. There's some metal that's sandwiched between absorber, absorber sheets, and we can separate our enclosures into little compartments. And devices in these compartments are about 30 to 40 dB isolated from one another. That's another kind of a combiner. They're fixed position. We cannot change attenuation between them programmatically, but sometimes you just want a cluster of, let's say you're doing IoT testing, you want a cluster of sensors that are fixed. They don't move around. And you can have them all in this one box. We have different sizes of enclosures up front here. There are two sizes. The top enclosure is what we call box 38. That's our biggest one. And 38 is 38 inches from ear to ear width. Yes? Um, yep, okay. Is that where you got your box names? Yep, that's where we got them. <laughs> that's where we got them. Box 26 is shown here, and there's one in the back. And then box 18s are also in, in, in the bottom, and it's consistent. So ear to ear inches. Sorry, guys, for those of you in Europe and the rest of the world. So yeah, so we um, so that's another way to combine. We can also combine lot, you know, high density of small devices, and the closer they're together, usually the less isolation we can have. But sometimes that's okay. And of course, we can mix and match. We have all kinds of brackets. We can mix and match different size enclosures. We can create a very dense mesh in a very small footprint, and we can mesh these together. So uh, really, it's very expandable topology. All right, so conducted, conducted meshes. Some of you think conducted is well controlled. I would um, 
challenge you to think again because uh, I come from the conducted world and that's why our company built over the air stuff. So let's say you're building a, uh, an eight node mesh, okay? So you have here an eight way splitter. Let's say from each node you go to seven other nodes, okay? And this splitter, it's my, there are eight lines and they're all MIMO. Let's say they're all four by four MIMO. So right away you have 32 cables. You've got, by the end of you cable this up, this is a big spider web, a big mess of cables. You cannot trace your way through it. You cannot even dig your way physically. If you use double shielded cables, they tend to be thick. So this is not simple. And uh, also you've got issues with return loss and a lot of these splitters are, they leak. They, they pick up interference even from one another when they're dense, but more so from the outside. And this one we built before we had our own combiner. We went to create a mesh uh, system and we used off the shelf mini circuits, whatever, I don't remember which. And we picked up a lot of interference. So we went and we had to build a whole new enclosure, stuff these things in and you know, it's much more expensive. But anyway, it's a mess if you want to really isolate them. And uh, then we ended up build building our own splitters after that. Uh, so yeah, so it's, uh, it's a big mess. But another thing, but, and this of course goes back to combiner isolation, coupling inside that we referred to earlier. And this of course, we are subject to this both over the air and in the cabled networks. But over the air we have a little bit of control by spreading our antennas, even putting them in the corners like we'll show you with Sushri's demo in a few minutes. Uh, but uh, in the c conducted combiners, we're stuck. That's our coupling, all right? So what happens, let's say, this is an example. Let's say we want to have 50 dB of a uh, path loss between, or let's say we want, it's easier to work with power. So let's say we want minus 50 dB um, uh, at, at node three here from four to three, okay? But in this mesh, we have a bunch of paths that are in parallel. You see, I'm going to go back here, see all this? So we've just highlighted every, you know, couple of paths that are subject to that coupling loss. And they are all sitting in parallel with this path that we are trying to control. And so each, let's say we go four to one to three from this path. And if we do the math, all of a sudden you don't get your intended power you get 20 dB higher power, depends on how you set up the mesh, uh, and so forth. And the more, obviously, parallel paths you add, the more power you couple through multiple paths. So this is true of everything, even real life, right? If we have, let's say, mesh nodes here, I move one of them, I can't move it with respect to just one, it will necessarily physically move with respect to everything, right? And it's the same thing here. It's just important to understand. Uh, we still have a fair amount of control of the mesh. We can isolate. We can move all the nodes out of range. We can move all of them in close proximity. And we can control it to some extent. But when we start writing software and scripts, it's important to keep in mind these dependencies and work around them. Another um, tool we have is a, is a quad switch we recently introduced. It's also in the stack. And again, these little dots are four connectors. That's what it is. Uh, two to one switch and we can isolate stuff or switch our circuitry without messing around with the cables. We don't like connecting, disconnecting RF cables. We like everything to be done in the script. Uh, this way you don't thread your connectors and mix things up. So yeah, so it's another tool to use. Yet another variation, if you are uh, happy with the start topology, there is, we talked about uh, reactive splitters or they're magnetically coupled. There is another architecture for splitters resistive. And it's basically a resistor network. We've used off the shelf splitters uh, in the past when we needed them. We don't make them, but if you have four of them, you can still create a four by four MIMO link. And, if, uh, and they are symmetric, so each terminal, you have 18 dB, so the common, non-common terminals on the magnetic splitter, they will vary by a few dB, the, um, the coupling 
from terminal to terminal. And these are well controlled because they are resistive and you can count on this 18 dB or the, the number depends on the number of terminals. It could be a four-way splitter, it could be a two-way, you know, whatever. It's, it's a resistive splitter and it behaves in a very controlled way if you need this. And this, this is good for start topologies. So from any node to any other node, if you set the tenures to zero, you have some fixed loss through this central point. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to introduce a little bit what Sushi is going to do. But uh, we have uh, into e what it, what we have here is a four node mesh. It's a, it's a in that office that's facing the window. And we'll show you guys during the break. You can go look at it. This is a photo of the inside of it. And we have uh, from each node to the other three nodes. So we have root and hop one and hop one and hop two here. And then we put uh, a Netgear 7800 access point in the fourth one. And we're showing three links from no node one to two and to the root. You see these three links. And from every other enclosure, we also have three links. We just didn't want to make a rat's nest, so we labeled them. So this, we have two to one, then this is labeled two to three. It goes here, two to three, two to four, and you get the idea. Okay, so these attenuators we call our mesh attenuators. When Sushi is going to set them all to zero dB, you will see the isolation between between them, we, you will see that you will bring the signal levels within 20 dB, and that's very good. That means you have you can bring all these nodes very close together. The other side, we are coupling some client devices. They could be clients, they could be other APs. In the in our case, we are combining the PALs. The PAL can be a client, an access point or multiple clients, or a monitor, or, or a sniffer, or a load generator. And we're not going to demo all of it here because it's out of context for the meshes. But we use them for demo. And they're very good to use as, as kind of tools, uh, instruments, if you will. We have a bunch of PALs in the small net builder test bed. Tuan's going to go in detail how we use them. But here we have basically we have a common PAL that has a, through a, an attenuator, it has a path into each node. We can control how close or far away it is. And we have a local PAL that can uh, just monitor or introduce load or just associate a bunch of clients with each node. So a, a variety of ways we can use it. We have these four, these antenna symbols. By the way, these symbols, all of our symbols are quad. And we don't draw individual antennas because otherwise the diagram becomes really cluttered and impossible to read. So all of these are quad. They're all four by four links. And so each of these symbols is this uh, column of antennas. So you can see they're in the corners, four corners. And with these four corners, we actually can reduce the coupling, this combiner coupling, by quite a bit. It may even be higher than 35 dB. Uh, but there is some 30 some dB of uh, coupling there. So. And we look at the losses with the monitor. Either this one, we can point it to any box, like we could zero one of the attenuators and then make the others maximum. So this common pal will see only one box, one at a time. And you can see what happens when we isolate them or move them in. You can see the difference in the signals that we're picking up. Okay. And you can monitor also with a local PAL, or you can use that for traffic or whatever. It's a, it's a pretty nice, it's a very simple test, but you'll see it's small. But there's a lot you can do with it. So basically, Sushi's going to take over, but she's going to take this pal that's on the side here, and she's going to change the attenuators and, and essentially move it around the mesh, and, and it'll roam. And she can also move, she's going to move these mesh nodes together or farther apart. She, has a, she doesn't have all these pals. I think we had we raided this test bed for components, so she's got only two of them left. It started out with four. How many do you have now? Two? Two left. Okay, but enough for a demo. And so we have these local piles. That's what those are. And that those you can also move around because they're with attenuators. And of course, you see these local, we put a combiner here, a conducted combiner. And of course, you can do more, you can put more piles, you can through this combiner, they don't have to be fixed. They can also be 
you know, you can combine them. You can even have one to four here. You still have plenty of signal range. And you can put a complex network of clients and other AP devices, and each of them has individual level control. And you can move them around the mesh this way. Does that make sense? Because Sushi will show you she can move any device on this common pal to any cell here. And, and then Nandini will show us a little more intricate roaming where we control velocity and we have more observability and so forth. Okay, so I'm going to hand this to Sushri. Thanks, Fanny. I think she gave a brief introduction of my setup. We all can have a look in the break. So is this visible to everyone? Yeah, great. Right. So uh, this is the four node mesh we have in our office. I have a root node in box three with the extenders in box one and two and R7800 in box four. Each of the node is connected to all the other three nodes via uh, an attenuator, which is called the meshing attenuator. We can control this to bring the nodes uh, close and far apart, as Fanny explained. And on the left is the common pal, uh, which, uh, just a second, yeah. So on the left is the common pal, which I'll be using to monitor each node to see if it is isolated from other nodes, as well as uh, to use it as a client to associate to any one of the node and then roam between different nodes. So to begin with, what I will be doing is I'll put the PAL in monitor mode and I'll have the path to the box one set to zero. And I'll isolate all the boxes by maximizing the rest of the attenuators. And to do that, I have this tool which will help me control all of the quadratants at once. So as you can see, on the right, I have all the meshing attenuators and on the left are the attenuators leading to each of the boxes like this one, dot 20, dot 21, dot 23, so on. So I just have the dot 20 set to zero so the PAL can only see box one and all of the other are set to max. So if I go and hit apply, it'll set all the attenuators and we can see on our PAL user interface I have set the PAL to mo in the monitoring mode and set the channel width to 80 megahertz and primary channel 36. So as we can see, we are now able to hear only one MAC address. That is because I have completely isolated uh, the other nodes from box one. And if we want to uh, match the MAC address, it is 23.5F, which is from box one. So this, this proves that the PAL is only able to see box one. And next, what I can do is I can bring all of the nodes close to each other. So all the nodes hear each other and I can use the same PAL to monitor node one and then I'll be able to see the uh, signal levels from all the other boxes once I do it. And here we go, hit apply. So as soon as I hit apply, you can see that we have three more MAC addresses popping up in a PAL user, uh, user interface, and we can correspond to, uh, corres um, we can match the MAC addresses to each of the nodes noted on the PowerPoint. And the strongest one is coming from the node inside the box since it is directly hearing that MAC address, and it's at negative 30, and all the other nodes at around, uh, negative 50 so we have a path loss of around 20 db give or take between each node so next i'm going to bring all the nodes uh, i'm going to move apart all the nodes at let's say 20 db that way it will uh, simulate an environment a home environment where the nodes are like a bit far apart from each other and then we can see the difference in rssi levels so hit apply and yeah now you can see that the difference in the rssi levels between the uh, box one and the other nodes are around let's say 35 to 40 db so that explains uh how the how we have a uh, good control over the range of the nodes and how the nodes see each other i can bring it completely close to each other or can move them far apart 
And next, what I'll do is I'll use the common pal as a client to associate to node one, and then I'll roam it to node three or node two or whatever we want. Now I'll be using uh, the pal in the traffic node so that it associates to my uh, root, uh, my nodes in, as a station. So this is our pal user interface for, um, for traffic mode. Nandini will be showing you all of the different parameters which you can control uh, in the PAL user interface. And uh, right now, it is, uh, it is setting up the interfaces. And as you can see here, it is right now connected to this BSSID 235F, which is box one. I can just move it here. So 235F over here is box one. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, flip over from box one to the root node, which is in box three. And once I do that, we will again monitor the PAL and see which BSSID it is connected to. So I'm going to change the attenuator leading to the root node to zero. And once I do that, the PAL will start scanning because it lost connection to the node one. And then it will start scanning the channel and uh, look for a better signal level. So now it is associated. It found a better channel. The BSSID it is connected to is FCD9. And if you, if you, I'm sorry. If you look on the power point, FCD9 is our root node, which is in box three. And again, I can move it between any two nodes. Let's say if I now want to move to box four, I can set node three to max and deattenuate the attenuator leading to box four. So, so this was pretty quick and we uh, now it is at B20B. So if you go to the figure again and you see B20B is the 7800. So the PAL just roamed so quickly to the, to the other node. And with that, I'll be handing over to Nandini. So Sushri showed you a four node mesh where she had four nodes in four different boxes. What we did is we took one of those nodes and we put some instruments on top of them. And I'm going to show you a couple of different tests we can do on each of these four node mesh uh, nodes. And this also is our standard test bed, which is our stack benchtop. You can see that it's right behind you. It's set up right there. It's got a lot of instruments on it. And I'm going to be showing you some tests with those instruments. So the first thing I'm going to show you is Sushi basically changed some attenuators to 60 dB and she moved the PAL around between different nodes. I'm going, to sh I'm going to regulate the velocity of the roam using our automated roaming script. And I have a phone inside, and I'm going to move it between two access points, AP1 and AP2. And during this, uh, during this roam, you have a lot of data rate adaptation happening because the phone is basically moving away from one access point, connecting back to the other. And there's also some time that traverses between the roam when the phone associates from one access point to another. So in this setup, I have two PALs. Um, one of the PALs is going to be an access point, AP1. The other PAL is going to be AP2. I have a phone here that's going to roam between AP1 and AP2 as I control these two attenuators to the PALs. So this is our automated roaming script. The phone is right now on access point 1, and I have a camera. Uh, it's not really good, but the phone's on AP1. When, I'm, when I regulate the velocity of the ramp and move the phone from AP1 to AP2, we'll see the phone disconnect. And I'm going to do this. And on the, u on the camera, you'll see the phone disconnect from AP1. It'll show Wi-Fi disconnected. Well, use your imagination. <laughs> the camera is pretty bad. It says Wi-Fi disconnected, yeah. and then it'll connect back to AP2. 
so the script also keeps pinging the phone while it's doing this roaming so you see a drop in pings when the phone actually moved from access point one to access point two and this is an auto generated plot at the end of the test which is going to pop up and it looks like this you can see the dropout here and the phone took pretty much this long to connect from one access point to another so these were the pals in access point access point mode i had ap1 i had ap2 and these are the two pals but during this roam you also have a lot of data rate adaptation happening when the phone actually disconnects from one access point connects to another so i'm going to show you the adaptation that happens using a pal as the client and i'm going to show you what happens when the PAL actually moves away from the access point. In this case, it can also be done in a mesh node where the PAL is seeing all the different uh, four node mesh and it's actually moving away from all the nodes. And you can, you have a lot of insight into what is actually going on adaptation wise. So this is the diagram for my test. I have a PAL that's going to be a station to this access point under test. And I have another PAL that's going to monitor the link between the Octobox server and the PAL, um, and it'll monitor all the adaptation behavior that's happening. I'm going to go set this PAL as a station associated to that access point under test. Set my attenuator back to 0 dB, and I'm going to change this PAL to a monitor. Basically, it's setting up the monitor mode, and as soon as it sets it up, it'll start picking up all the MAC addresses that it's seeing, just like how Sushri showed you in the in her demo. So this is the PAL in station mode, and I move my attenuator to AP2. So I'm going to set it back. So this monitor pal right now is picking up all the MAC addresses it's seeing. One of them um, is the AP. And this, um, this pal that's a station is going to associate to that access point under test. So I'm going to make sure my attenuators are zeroed out. And um, this is the Octobox software suite. You have configurations on the left, and there's, um, we're going to see some plots on the right. The traffic is going to run from the Octobox server through the access point to the PAL. And I'm going to step attenuation in steps of 10 dB for every 20 seconds. And we'll see the data rate adaptation behavior as the PAL slowly disconnects and moves away from the access point in the roaming scenario. There, there are a lot of settings on the right-hand side. Each of them are controllable channel width, MCS, um, and Fanny will talk about this a little bit later. But um, this pal is on monitor. This pal is now a station. And I'm going to run my test. So it's setting up the monitor. And as soon as the monitor is set up, you're seeing live throughput data. I think I'm going to stop this test and run it again. So you're seeing live throughput data to that PAL averaged over every one second. And down below, you're also seeing maximum data rates of 1733 in that Octobox 26, which speaks to the rich MIMO environment we have in each of those Octoboxes. But it's also at, we also get insight into the MCS data rate bandwidth number of streams. And it's right now at MCS 9. 
with number of streams 480 megahertz. And we're seeing live throughput data up here. And after 10 seconds, so I have, I have the attenuator stepping up in 10 dB steps for every 20 seconds. So you're seeing adaptation behavior start to occur here in data rate. And you're also seeing the RSSI step down by 10 dB steps for every 20 seconds. And as this test goes through, it's going gonna, it's gonna to actually disconnect the PAL from the access point. And we'll actually see that disconnection happen. And during the roam, you'll be able to get all, all information that you're seeing on the screen here. MCS is holding steady at 9. As soon as the signal level changes further, MCS will start adapting as well. So now you can see that the data rate has stepped down to 1300, which is 3 by 3 rates. And you can see MCS has dropped down to MCS 7, and the rate has dropped down according to that as well. Live throughput data is still plotting. It's going at 950, but it's starting to get unstable. And you're seeing the disconnection start to happen. Um, and the throughput is actually stepping down right here. At the end of the test, you'll also get to see average data, which will show you throughput versus attenuation. And this is average throughput for each attenuation, attenuation step. So you're seeing the throughput drop with increase in attenuation. And you're seeing that traffic has stopped uh, because the attenuation is way too high at 60 dB. And the PAL has actually disconnected from the access point. So the client's not associated to the access point anymore. So you can see throughput versus range here. And, and you can also export CSV reports to see the raw data for your test. So you can see all the raw data, everything that you collected from the graph. And you can export PDF reports, which will show you the entire test configuration diagram. Um, I have some reports saved. And um, I'm going to pull up those reports. And this is a test report for the test that you just saw. And it's generated automatically, which shows you throughput versus range for the test with all the information. Now, another thing you can test in your mesh scenario is if the mesh nodes um, you can test a DFS test. So if the mesh nodes basically detect radar and if they change channel from the DFS channel. So that's the other thing I'm going to show in this demo today. And my diagram is going to be right here. So I have a PAL that's going to be a station just like I had now. And I have another PAL which I'm going to turn into a sniffer. And this iGen is going to introduce radar interference in the DFS channel. And as soon as it introduces radar interference, the access point will move off of that DFS channel. And we'll look for the channel switch announcement using the sniffer PAL. And we'll see if the PAL followed that channel switch announcement. I'm going to go to the access point. So you have multiple DFS channels here. I'm going to use channel 52. And as soon as my AP changes its channel, the PAL will associate on that channel, the DFS channel. And I will change this monitor PAL into packet capture mode, which will make it a sniffer, and will capture all the packets. So as soon as the AP comes up, the PAL will associate on channel 52. So what we're going to see is when we open the packet after the when we open the packet after we introduce radar interference there will be a channel number specifying that it's moving to this particular channel and the client will follow that channel and it will associate on that particular channel. So 
So we'll see if the access point um, is up. I'm going to change it to channel 52. another DFS channel. Let's see. Maybe channel 100. So I'm going to use channel 100 here. That's another DFS channel. And the PAL will associate on that DFS channel. So right now the PAL is associated on DFS channel 100. And I'm going to use this other PAL as a packet capture on channel 100. I'm going to set it up. And as soon as it starts capturing beacon packets on channel 100, I go to the iGen. And I'll introduce radar interference on channel 100. And the AP will actually move off of that DFS channel and give a channel switch announcement to the client. So it's capturing beacons now. I'm going to go to the iGen, hit start, and radar interference is introduced. Now the AP has moved off of that DFS channel, so the PAL has followed that move as well. So I'm going to stop this, and we'll see where the AP moved. We'll look for the channel switch announcement. I'm going to go to packet capture mode. Download this. Open the captures in Wireshark. What we're seeing here is that the AP was transmitting, I'm going to apply a filter, but the AP was transmitting beacons just fine. And we'll look for the last beacon packet, and that should have the channel switch announcement. So this is the last beacon packet. So I'm going to open the packet. And you can see the channel switch announcement here. And the AP has actually moved to channel 161. It's asking all its clients to move to channel 161 as well. And we'll go to the PAL. And the PAL is associated on channel 161, following the channel switch from the access point. All right. Now, one other thing you can test in the mesh uh, is by loading the mesh with multiple clients. So let's say you're in a coffee house that's using a mesh extender scenario. And there are multiple people with different devices like phones, laptops, connecting to these extender devices. What, what happens then? How does the mesh roam these devices between the right node and the others? So the PALs are capable of emulating up to 32 different virtual stations. Each of them can have different personalities for interface, bandwidth, number of streams. And I'm going to be showing you a test that will show the PALs. Um, with different virtual stations. And I'll bring up the diagram. So this test basically has our PAL24, which is our 2.4 gigahertz PAL. And I'm going to associate four virtual stations through to the access point on the 2.4 gigahertz band. And I'm going to use this other PAL to associate four virtual stations on the 5 gigahertz band. And we'll run simultaneous traffic to all of them. And in a mesh scenario, you can actually roam these virtual stations between different nodes, just like how Sushri did, by changing these attenuators around. But I'm actually going to run a throughput versus range test to, connect, to disconnect all these. Um, and I'm going to run traffic to all these virtual stations at the same time. So this is our PAL24. I have four virtual stations. I'm going to hit play. And I'm going to use this PAL and associate four virtual stations here. So here you can see on the PAL24, there are four, four virtual stations that have come up. And as soon as it finds the channel, it will associate all those four virtual stations. So it's on channel 6 right now. And you see this Edit button here. You can go here. You can change the interface. You can change the bandwidth number of streams, so you can have SISO, 2x2, two 3x3, two, three three, a mixture of all of them in your air link. You can, change the you can change the priority for traffic and the transmit power for each virtual station. 
so right now four virtual stations are associated and on this pal we have four virtual stations associated here as well so I'm going to go to my test here are my graphs from my previous test and I have two attenuators ranging from 10 to 50 dB in 10 dB steps which I'm controlling in parallel so I'm going to hit the run button and what you're seeing here is live throughput data to all of those virtual stations and I'm going to run this to the point of disconnection so the virtual stations will actually move away from the access point but you're also seeing individual throughput to each of those virtual stations you're seeing some high throughput for the 5 gigahertz and you're seeing some low throughput for the 2.4 gigahertz um, stations and then on the PAL user interface you also get to see um, RSSI per chain so each of the chains of the PAL you can see the RSSI and see if you're getting you know the same RSSI from the same nodes and you can also see the TXRX rates updating in real time they're 1733 which is max and for the PAL24 you can see the 800 rates and as attenuation is stepping up you can see RSSI actually stepping down and towards the end of the test you will see uh, that throughput drops off and you can disable this aggregate throughput and look at the individual throughput and you can see some changes here as adaptation happens to each of this and I enable that aggregate again so right now attenuation is at 40 dB and as it steps up even further the AP will load balance and try to give uh, more priority to the faster clients and lesser priority to the slower clients and kick it off so right now you're seeing traffic is not going through because all of them are disassociated from the access point at the end of the test you also get to see average data but this one is showing you the average data for the aggregate throughput that we got to all of those virtual stations and our next uh, topic is roaming and band steering we've already of course shown you the roaming demo and uh, the next kind of big thing for our customers to test is band steering and all of this is about what if you remember Nandini's plot a break for I don't know eight to ten seconds there okay so um, what's band steering so band steering is a way to take the slow client off where we don't want it and put it to another AP or mesh node where it's better to, for it to be either a node or a different band so Nandini already mentioned 2.4 gigahertz band because it, of its limited bandwidth we tend to put slower devices there and 5 gigahertz band we like to keep for 80 megahertz bands for 4x4 MIMO capable devices that are close for example if the device is on 5 gigahertz band that moves away through the house and ends up adapting down to do beam forming instead of mm, spatial multiplexing no longer has four streams it's just barely hanging on to that AP we want to kick it off we say no more five gigahertz for you you go to either another mesh node or you go to 2.4 now this has been challenging because of course our APs and mesh nodes we can program them to do it but we can't control the clients there people bring phones uh, you know laptops pads and they don't always behave and they don't always listen and so these mesh nodes and APs they set up some thresholds to basically steer slow devices to slow bands or local devices to local APs uh, and there are some thresholds for example RSSI you can say okay if my device uh, if I'm an AP and I hear a device at a very low level and, I, and it's at 5 gigahertz band and it's barely you know at 6 megabits per second or some low rate I don't want to talk to it I'm going to disassociate I'm going to kick it out so that's the threshold say there is some RSSI threshold there's some data rate threshold and there's some load threshold if a device for example is causing very heavy load and 
hugging your airlink, your channel, you may want to say maybe the mesh is aware of some other mesh node that has more capacity. And it would say, I want to disassociate you. I want you to go somewhere else or to another band. And so that's what we regulate. We, we have some meshes that will steer from band to band, some meshes that will steer from node to node and steer to maybe even two of the five gigahertz bands if they have three radios. We have all these bands on each AP. As I believe is the case with the Orbeez that we have here in the mesh. And um, well, of course, 11V is a more direct and a much faster way if the client supports it. 11V is a management protocol and we use it to tell the client directly, okay, you go to that band, you go to that AP, we don't want you here. And that's a very efficient way, very fast, bang the client roam. If only the world was that simple. Okay, but this is just a little bit of a review. Uh, IEEE has defined these amendments to that 11 some time ago. And now with the meshes, with us all being concerned about capacity and efficiency on these networks, they're starting to get implemented. Uh, so these amendments are uh, 11R, 11K, and 11V that I just mentioned, 11V. And of course, uh, so 11K came before 11V. And it's, uh, a, uh, it's an amendment that specifies a way to, to make measurements. Like what is my RSSI, what is the load, you know, stuff like that. Um, physical conditions and then 11V is the management. So this is measurements and then we can, based on measurements, we can manage. So we get information from 11K in the database and 11V says, okay, here, let's do some load sharing, some band steering based on this information. 11R is a fast roaming standard mostly designed for the enterprises. So when, when a phone roams from one AP to another, 11R ensures there is authentication information distributed in the mobility domain. Some access points in that domain will have it pre-authenticated so the roam can happen with an unnoticeable number for audio, for example. Right. For audio, uh, we don't want to have eight second roam. Even for IP session, we don't want to have eight second roam. Uh, but for audio, it's particularly bad. Audio is the highest priority service. If you start missing packets and if you miss a burst of packets, anything over 200 millisecond is audible. It comes across as a click. So no, we don't want multi-second roams because we are going to drop our connection. Uh, we also don't want jitter. Jitter happens. This is delay variation, packet to packet delay variation. So audi audio packets are tiny. They're 100 to 200 microsecond long, but the gaps could be 20 milliseconds. So they don't introduce any load on the link. But it is important for the packets to come in an isochronous manner so that the coder, coder decoder, can recover them. And so there are some limits on jitter. If, if there's a lot of load, AP is overloaded, it starts dropping packets, it starts delaying them because they're in the queue, this or that, and we get variation from the source to destination of this voice data. Other things that can cause jitter is sleep modes, um, and priority is very important for the phone. Priority, so um, just to mention WMM, this is a good illustration of how priority works. Uh, an example, so we took three of our iGens and we gave them the same packets to replay. They have exactly the same PCAP file we loaded in. Put them all on best effort in the quiet acta box. And this is a measure of capacity, packet rate on the airlink. So here we see they are about equal. They take about equal amount of the airlink. Then we took one of these uh, iGens and we set it to video priority. That's all we changed. It's still replaying the same pattern. And now the video traffic is taking a lot more capacity and it's dropping uh, out these guys out from best effort. Then we took one, this green guy, put it on voice priority, and now voice priority has better access to the medium. And it works uh, extremely well. It's all statistical in Wi-Fi. Uh, if you're interested in the details, um, 
see me after class. <laughs> but uh, it does work. And uh, by the way, our PALS and IGN, they are all, they behave uh, for priority as well as VISTAs. You can set them to the different priorities, each VISTA, so that either traffic or interference can be made more or less aggressive. And you can also disable, you can disable back off, which means you're making that device into a jammer, which today is only possible with, tra with um, pattern generators, uh, but not possible with real devices. But the PALs and IGNs will do that. OK, so that's about it for the need. So the, to summarize is with the tools that we have for mesh, uh, we can control the traffic, how aggressive the traffic is, interference, uh, radar interference, DFS, motion, uh, and our PALS will soon support 11V. We're working on it. Uh, and for now, they can be programmed to be sticky clients or not sticky clients. We actually have control over the threshold at which they roam. How do we measure mesh performance? So a few things about meshes. Of course, they're self-forming, self-healing. We want to test that. We want to break some links and see what happens, whether the mesh heals itself, finds a way around the link. So we've got these are mesh nodes. Um, throughput and other QS parameters, delay, jitter, everything you measure is a function of hops. So if we need traffic to go through one hop or two hops, Tuan's going to show us a demo of one and two hop. Uh, what happens? For throughput, if this is a single radio mesh hop, then throughput will drop in half. Why? Uh, because uh, it, if it's the same channel, you can't have these two signals receive and transmit on the air at the same time. You need to receive one and transmit another. So you're mm -hmm. halving it right off the bat um, and uh, so forth across the hops. If you have multi-radio meshes, this performance can Im improve if you receive and retransmit on different channels. But then you have to measure your, your manage your neighboring links. So throughput QoS versus range, Nandini showed some of that. We can spread them out. This is a physical air measurement, uh, MCS and so forth, number of stream adaptation, MIMA mode adaptation happens here. Routing efficiency, you know, how well are we, are we connecting through the right number of hops? Sometimes one hop is worse than two hops. If one hop has, has let's say, less signal, a, a lower RSSI. Or, or noise on it, and two hops, just like we inserted a repeater in the early days. It helps you. So you need to test, make, test all these cases. Uh, if uh, one hop has interference, does the mesh reroute? Is the mesh smart enough to manage that? Load and so forth. So really, to s it's, this is just a repeat, the summary. So. We want to measure throughput versus number of hops. And we should measure it through one hop, two hop, three hops. Maybe a linear mesh uh, is, is suitable for that. Number of users per hop. So these are different variables. We can put them all together. If, let's say, you're testing in a house, open air, you don't control these variables, how many users are there sometimes. Maybe you can. But in, uh, in the Octobox, you can control them. Or in a controlled environment, you can control them. Traffic load per hop, backhaul load, and all that. So these are some important considerations. And of course, there's a lot of detail for each of these bullets. And I'm not going to go into detail, but of course, we're here. And what we're going to do instead is show you a demo of this small net builder mesh. This is what SNB stands for. This is our most sophisticated test bed. So Nandini worked with stack benchtop. And uh, Tuan's going to work with stack SNB. And, S and he's going to work in particular with the lower part of it, because this is a mesh seminar. Uh, we're not going to use the top part of it as throughput performance, throughput versus rotation, that's polar plots. And uh, this is outside the scope of this session. But if you'd like to stay and play with it, you're welcome to do that. And we have our multipath emulator here. All of these instruments here. There, you can see them. I can see them flashing lights. Maybe you can't see the lights, but um, we're going to use them as clients in the mesh and as as uh, you know combiners and attenuators to form a mesh. This is the block diagram of Small Net Builder. 
So this yellow square is not actually an enclosure. It's all those uh, metal boxes. And inside of it is a block diagram here. Uh, so we have a quad switch. One side of it goes up through the MPE to do throughput tests. MIMO, multi-user MIMO rotation. We're not going to do that. We're only going to keep the switch here. In, and we are basically uh, have these three outputs. And all of our PALs, we have three of them. And they're going to go into the mesh here. So we have a link here to small net builder. We developed this testbed, and, and there is a script. So that's another thing. Uh, so Tuan's going to run a Python script. Okay, so the demo is a little boring because there's just text scrolling and command line. But the nice thing about it is the script connects into our database. So all these plots Nandini showed you, um, we, we have a, a database. It can, in fact, be a distributed database. So multiple uh, test beds can write into the same database. Each test bed has its own server. So we can browse and we can control the test bed via server. But the database can be shared among multiple test beds. So the server controls all the instruments. Um, and um, when you write scripts, what Nandini was showing us, she was clicking on pull down menus and attenuator ranges and stuff. And instead of clicking, what Tuan's going to do is going to be a little more boring, but a lot less work. He's going to run a Python script to do all the clicking. And at the end, the results are going to end up in the database. OK, so a lot of you are asking, you know, can we script it? Yes. Uh, we have API for every control in our UI uh, for traffic. Uh, and, and you can, we do write, and we have developed the script um, collaboratively with Small Net Builder. Um, and it does these tests. If you go to this link, uh, you, um, you end up on Small Net Builder website, and it describes v10, version 10 of the testbed. And, um, it does these tests in order. So if we actually go there, uh, we, um, these are the tests. This is the page. And there is a methodology. And, and he explains in, in some depth what he's doing. And we are going to just uh, go through it and show you how it works. So wired, wired tests, we're not going to demo because it's basically when to land throughput. You can do it through our filters. So once you put the whole mesh in there, you can do a wire test as well. And we're, not, we're just not going to demo it. And we're going to start the demo of all these wireless tests, so these, these wireless tests. So before we run any of these tests, what Tuan's going to well, maybe talk about, or maybe you already did it, we have to do a BSSID discovery. What that means is we, well, these mesh nodes are on the same SSID. But for some of the tests, we need to connect some paths to some specific mesh nodes. So we need to know BSSIDs. And we discover them. The script goes and listens in each uh, of the mesh nodes on 2.4 and 5 gigahertz and records them. And then the other scripts use it. Before we run any of the tests, we have to get the BSSID of every, each, each and every node. <coughs> so. In order to do that, well, I'll go into the console and just run the script first, and I'll explain in detail of how we do it. So this Python script, when we click to BSSID discovery, it's just going to in, go into each and every node. I'm going to show you a block diagram of how we do it. <coughs> so the, the path highlighted in red is the path we're using. So it goes and sets up our PAL into 2.4 gigahertz. And it set this attenuate 3 to a low value and set the rest of them to a high value. Therefore, this PAL only sees hop 2 box. So therefore, you can discover the BSSID for 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz, which the PAL will go into, get it, save it, <coughs> and get for hop 2. We'll do the same for hop 1. So it's setting the same thing. And we get the 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz BSSID for hop 1, as well as the root node. And that's what the script is doing right now. So it's configuring the PAL autonomously, which Nandini was clicking earlier. And I don't have to do it because it's automated. And let's see how the script's going. And it's still discovering right now. So I'm going to move on with the next slide. <coughs> so for system capacity tests, this test 
had small node builder, they took each pal and connected it to each of the nodes in different bands. So therefore, in hop2 has a pal that's connected to it, and they'll run throughput to it for uplink and downlink on the 244 gears and the 5 gears bands. So that way you get the full throughput for all of them. And that's the capacity test. So let me check back on how the BSSID discovery is going. And it's still discovering. So I'll run the capacity after it finishes discovering the BSSID. So I'll continue on to system backhaul. For system backhaul test, he checks for two hop and one hop. For this one, it's set to two hop. So we have a Linux PC that's Linux server that's running iperf3. And it's connected through Ethernet to hop2. And the path highlighted in red is the path that the test console is going to send traffic on. And it's going to go through hop1 and jump to hop2. Therefore, the, this is a two hop test. And there's no PAL involved in this one. And the same is done for hop1. However, it goes only one path, so that's why it's called one hop test. Let me check back real quick on the disco discovery. And I believe it's still running. So the script sets up the PAL. It sets it uh, automatically to um, a specific channel and just scans it and looks for a BSSID. So let me explain the next test while that's running. So the throughput versus the attenuation test, this is done through only the root node due to the fact that every other node has the same radio. So you can choose any of the nodes. Um, Small Net Builder chose the root node to run this test. He has the path through this attenuator 5 here. He uh, uses attenuator 5 to vary the attenuation so that way he can do the throughput versus attenuation test and he runs it through the root node only. I believe. So now it's done discovering the BSS IDs. I'll scroll up and show you how it looks like. He gets all of the boxes, and I'll have to cut this real quick. So he gets the BSS for box 1, 2, 3, for 5 gigahertz, and 2.4. And he sets it, he knows the channels as well, what they're set to. I'm just going to paste it in here and save that file, and I'll run the capacity test as mentioned. So I'm just going to run capacity while I explain the next test. So this is just automating all of the PALs. I'll go back to capacity to show you <coughs> what he's doing. He automates to set the PAL PALs to each of the nodes on different bands. So this PAL will be on connected to hop, one, hop 2, this PAL will be connected to hop 1, and this PAL will connect to the root node and run traffic to it on 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz for both uplink and downlink traffic. So let me go and explain the last slide. So the mesh system is measuring the maximum throughput for each of the nodes. <coughs> so here he has the PAL connected to hop 2 due to the BSS ID, which is discovered. He'll connect it to the 2.4 gigahertz band, run throughput for uplink and downlink. Then he'll go and set the PAL for 5 gigahertz and connect it and run uplink and downlink traffic for maximum throughput. And he'll do it the same way for every other node. So he does it for hop 1 as well as the root node. So we're back. The tests have been completed. All the tests have ran. And I'm just going to show you some of the results on our database. Here's one, <coughs> here's one of the results for mesh capacity down. So this right here, this line here is the aggregate throughput of all the three, no, uh, all the three PALs. <coughs> Each of these lines is each PAL's individual throughput. And <clears throat> as you can see, mesh capacity down with one hop, I believe. <clears throat> so the results are very similar to small net builder. The results for down one hop is about 214 Mbps. And here we're getting roughly the same if you just get the average of this, which is what he's using. Yep. This is the Google Mesh nodes in there. You can open a box and look inside if you need. And I can show another result <coughs> uh, backhaul. So backhaul down for two hops is about 120. And 
I believe we get a little bit more than what Tim's getting. Uh, sorry, small than Butler's getting. <clears throat> and that's pretty similar. And one more result I can show. So that one, let me grab it out. So he does save CSV files, and we can load up the CSVs which was ran. And this one was <clears throat> two hops, I believe. And this is for his backhaul down link. And this one is for <clears throat> backhaul uplink. And this is his average from throughout the whole test. So all of the results are saved as CSV, but in our database is also there, and you can export as PDF if you need. And the last part of our session is on different meshes. Bluetooth, Thread, ZigBee, Wison. Uh, I guess um, we haven't shown any active devices. We have some uh, new hardware coming soon that will address both Bluetooth and ZigBee. Uh, that will be able to monitor and also generate traffic. We are a little bit new to all these new other meshes, so we're covering them last. We're open to suggestions on how to test it, what tools you best uh, could use, but we will have, similar to the PAL, similar capabilities. And of course, the RF, uh, RF uh, environment uh, fits any technology. It doesn't matter what the signaling is. So Internet of Things, basically uh, we are targeting lots of devices. Some of them are low power devices, some of them are connected and cabled in, like light switches and so forth, air conditioning controls. And the, um, the um, prevalent connectivity uh, protocols for them are Bluetooth, Zigbee, and Wison outdoors. Um, but there are others. There's a 3GPP uh, new protocol as well. So a lot of these guys, Bluetooth, Zigbee, and Wison, they've been adopted. Um, they're related to 802.15 work. Uh, so Bluetooth SID took over from 802.15.1. And this work has been done outside of IEEE. Uh, Zigbee has adopted 802.15.4 Phi and Mac layer, but uh, Zigbee hasn't really defined uh, IP layer. They had different layer threes or no layer three uh, until Thread came along. And Thread, as you know, is Google uh, technology. They added IP protocol to that. And uh, Wison is another successful, widely adopted mesh for outdoors, for longer range technologies. Uh, DOT 15 also did um, 60 gigahertz. Uh, they did some work that was the basis for ADA to that 11 AD in the millimeter wave. Uh, but w this is outside of scope here. So a Bluetooth mesh is a synchronous. Uh, what that means is, uh, we have synchronized transmissions. And it's important for voice. Bluetooth has been used for headsets, in some cases for speakers, distributed audio, even high definition audio, as well as remote control. But for audio, isochronous is important, of course, because we have codecs, coders, decoders. They require regular, um, in regularly spaced packets to arrive at the decoder so we can recover the voice or the audio from bits and bytes. So Bluetooth meshes, Bluetooth can be as simple as a Piconet. This is basically a master and a slave. A slave locks its frequency, its clock to the master. It could be a multi-slave uh, operation uh, where you have multiple devices connected to a master and synchronize. And you can have what's called a scatter net where you have, you could have devices connected to multiple masters in, in a scatter net. So this is where Bluetooth mesh comes in. So um, <clears throat> piconets and scatter nets. So in a piconet, you have multiple devices in up to seven can be connected. 
inactive with the same master and synchronize inactively passing data. And you can have more devices that are in sleep mode, just sitting there, but still staying synchronized so they can jump in. Maybe they are saving the battery power because Bluetooth devices tend to be low power. Then you can have a group of Pika nets, of course, uh, that are called the scatter nets. Uh, if they cover the same area, these Pika nets, you can have devices, slave devices in more than one Pika net, but a master device only one one can be can be in one pika net cannot master which provides a synchronization cannot be in multiple pika nets at the same time so bluetooth <clears throat> i guess if we need i got some questions during the break you know how do we this is a lot of little sensors a lot of devices how do we form a mesh you know we already discussed there are ways to isolate them inside one box by creating uh, isolated compartments using metal and foam. And you can, of course, isolate them in smaller boxes with attenuators as well. So Thread and Zigbee, <coughs> we use here uh, 802.15.4 Mac and Phi, but Thread decided to use IP layer. So each of these Thread nodes has access to the internet using IPv6. So we have lots of addresses, which we need for IoT because we have a lot of devices. And low power wireless personal area networks, so low pan IPv6 type of technology. Data rates are up to 20 kilobits per second. So this is definitely not for voice, it's for sensors. I have a thread thermostat at home. Uh, and the way that Zigbee, so <coughs> thread made use of the Zigbee meshing technology so that's the MAC protocol and the radio technology, but they put IPv6 layer over it, which Zigbee didn't do. And Zigbee, for a long time, we thought it was a failing technology because nobody adopted it, because they changed their, above the MAC, they changed uh, the layer 3 protocol a few times. I think version 3 was incompatible with version 2, some kind of disorganized evolution there. But then Thread came along, <coughs> and all of us thought, well, Zigbee's dead, gone. And all of a sudden, Zigbee's back. And it's now using Thread. And Thread is using it, so it's back. But it does have a nice uh, mesh, meshing Mac, which it was designed for meshing. We have end devices that could be uh, you know, switches, controls. And we have um, routers, which, which are usually cabled in. They could be you know, lights, um, light fixtures, thermostats, they usually have power fixtured in. Um, and these uh, end devices could be on battery, for example, could be battery sensors on windows and doors, and they could live on battery for a very long time, 10 years, they say, I don't know. And then you have coordinators. Any of these uh, routers can become a coordinator. If a coordinator gets powered down, goes away, another router can jump in and say, I'm a coordinator. There's a control way to form this mesh. The coordinator is in charge. <coughs> and the coordinator um, orders everything and is connected to the internet, connects the whole mesh to the internet. It's not the same as 11S. In 11S, it's more of an ad hoc, like the routers on the internet. The uh, mesh nodes are peers. Here is a little more hierarchical type of a mesh formation. Thread, of course, um, we have one, you know, have one at home. Thread is using this stack of these three small chambers, SISO links. These are yellow ones, are SISO. Our symbols for single antenna is yellow. For four antennas, is dark. Uh, and basically, each box goes to the other two boxes, hence two antennas in each. One quad antenna, and it's a very simple three-node mesh. And... Um, there is some um, mesh testing, some protocol testing done by the thread group. So the wider area network uh, protocols, they include the Wi-San Alliance, LTE release 13 has NB IoT, which is a IoT technology. And LoRaWAN is, is proprietary long range uh, technology, also long, very long battery life. So these three are 
I would say competing technologies for outdoors. Okay, so folks, uh, we're here uh, the rest of the afternoon. Um, you're welcome to stay and chat with us, and uh, we'll make the slides available, and um, we'll hopefully have a video as well soon, and we'll uh, email you the link. Thank you. Thank you.